Hey everybody, welcome to Send15. I am Professor Drews. If you haven't had me for any previous classes, welcome. It's nice to meet you. Uh, I wish we could be meeting actually in person like we had originally planned to meet in person, but hopefully that'll come up in about two weeks. So just as a, an overview of where the campus stands right now, the plan is that these first two weeks will be um, all remote, so we will keep meeting here on, on Twitch and chatting if we need to through Canvas. Um, if they allow us to go back in person on, um, what would that be, January like 13th, I think is the last day, um, then we'll transition back to in person. Um, I will keep the remote option available regardless of what they choose. Um, so we're going to review the syllabus here in a little bit, but I just wanted to lay that out there first. Um, Whatever ends up happening, you'll be able to complete the course remotely if you need to. Um, so don't fret that you know suddenly things change in two weeks and you had initially not planned to come on campus and now some reason you have to come on campus or you can't make it to campus or something like that. Um, it will continue in one form or another um, remotely. Um, so you'll be able to complete the class that way. Um, this is obviously a little different from uh, Zoom. I got a little bit tired of doing Zoom lectures over and over and over again. Um, so obviously now we're on Twitch. Um, there is a chat feature on Twitch, but if you're watching it on Twitch, don't bother trying to use the chat feature. Um, or I don't know, go for it. Like it, it's set in emote only mode right now, um, but I'm not paying attention to it. So I don't have Twitch chat open. I'm just not looking at it. Um, and at least during class, I would encourage you um, to keep it closed too, um, just so you don't see whatever shows up over there um, in chat. If you do need to contact me, um, the chat in Canvas is active. So that one I'm actually looking at. So if you send me a message in chat on Canvas, I'll see that. Um, but if you send me a message on Twitch chat, it's just going to get ignored. Um, I might look back through them at the end of class, but they're all going to be emotes only. So who knows? Um, if you uh, haven't used the chat over in Canvas before, which actually I haven't until I was playing around with it here, it looks like there is no way to send an anonymous um, chat. So if you just wanted to message me, I don't think there's a way to do that. Um, I'm going to ask our IT folks if there's a way to do that, because um, I know that was a nice feature from Zoom, was being able to directly ask your question to me. Uh, but right now, that chat is public to everyone in the class. So if you send a message on there, um, it's, it's just like raising your hand in class, right? Everybody's going to see your question. Um, I hope that doesn't dissuade you from asking a question because anytime that one person has a question, lots of other people have the same question. So please feel comfortable um, sending any uh, questions you have in that um, chat over there. Um, so let's switch over to um, the syllabus. There are a couple of points on there I just want to make sure that we're clear on. I'm not going to spend, I'm not, I'm not going to read it line by line because I assume you can read the syllabus at this point, um, but there are a couple of things on there that I want to um, point out. So um, let's switch over to the syllabus. Uh, so you should be able to see this in Canvas. Um, obviously, I'm showing it here as well, which, by the way, one other point before we keep going. I'm trying to make everything on the screen fairly large. Um, it's my assumption that throughout most of the class, you're going to try to split screen, so you'll have either Excel or MATLAB open on one side where we're doing work, um, and then our lecture open on another window. Um, so if you're on a laptop or something like that, it's probably going to be kind of small. Um, so I'll try to make most of the fonts fairly large um, so that you can see stuff like that. Or if you want to watch it on your phone, um, it should be big enough that you can see what I'm typing um, on the phone in, in most cases. Um, so just some generic information about the course listing up here. Um, I did want to emphasize the title of our class. It's Engineering Computation Using MATLAB. There's, first of all, two elements to that. The first is Engineering Computation. Um, so part of this class will be introducing you to the types of computation that we have to use um, as engineers, either nano engineers or chemical engineers. Um, the second part of that is using MATLAB. Those are two different things, right? Engineering computations can be done in nearly any program that can do math. Um, we just happen to choose MATLAB. Um, I'm going to be using Excel as sort of, I, I think of it as a hand calculator, like a, a super hand calculator. Uh, the nice thing about Excel is there's, there's no black box to Excel. You can see all of the numbers everywhere they are and 
how they update when something else changes. Um, and that's going to help us get a grasp on what the actual computation is that we're trying to achieve. Because then when we switch over to MATLAB, there's still lots of ways to view what's happening in MATLAB, but it's not quite as transparent as Excel is. No coding language is quite as transparent as Excel is, um, and they're not intended to be. So uh, that's the reason why we've got Excel for some of it and MATLAB for um, other parts. Uh, eventually, we will transition to the majority of the work um, being done at MATLAB, um, but that won't come until later on in the in the quarter. Um, we do have a TA for this class, um, Brige. So she's not here with us today, but I'm going to find a way to get her on to stream on either Wednesday or Friday um, so that you can meet her, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to meet her in person um, when we do hopefully come back in person. Um, as far as the lectures go, so you're in the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 12 to 1251 right now. Um, the one in the afternoon, you're more than welcome to show up to that as well. Uh, it's going to be the same thing twice. Um, so if, if you can't catch the morning one, you can go to the afternoon one. It'll be the same thing. Um, both, well, actually only one of them, I think, probably the afternoon one, uh, will also get posted on YouTube. So if you miss a lecture, you can always go to YouTube. Uh, and then in the uh, video description on YouTube will be any of the files that we make that day. Um, so any spreadsheets or, or functions or scripts or anything like that in MATLAB, um, those will get included so that you can follow along with all the material that's there. This lab one, it's a weird kind of lab. Think computer lab, right? If we were meeting in person, that's exactly what it would be, is you would come to class, you'd have your computer out, and it's a lab period for you to work on more or less anything that you want. It's it's there to have some dedicated time for this class um, so that you can ask me questions, you can ask brief question, questions. Um, it's We will never introduce any new material in there. Um, it's a period where you can work on homework or projects or whatever we happen to be doing um, at that particular time. Um, the final, uh, kind of up in the air. Um, if we revert back to in-person, there will be an actual in-person final. Um, if we have to stay remote, then we'll have to adjust that somehow, because I don't like doing remote finals that are restricted to a particular time. So it'll probably turn into like a remote project or something like that um, for the final. I kind of covered everything about COVID on here. The one that I wanted to point out um, is that you as a person, your health as a person, is more important to me than this class. Um, and so I will work with you to accommodate whatever you need during the quarter, um, particularly if it's related to COVID. Um, so if, if something comes up and you can't make it back or your, you know, your internet goes down for a couple of days or you get sick and you have to stop participating in the class for a while, as soon as you're feeling better, shoot me an email and we'll work something out. Um, I have had a few students in the past where, you know, maybe they miss two, three, four weeks of the class. That's not really something that I can create a single assignment for. But what I have done is actually extend the class into the next quarter. So in this case, extending it into the spring. Um, and that's something that I can do here. Um, all I would ask is if you need those accommodations, uh, please ask me. Um, you know, take your time to feel better. Um, but when you can, send me a message. Um, there's, there's no deadline by which, you know, I will, um, you know, automatically input zeros or something like that. If I don't hear from you, you know, let's say it happens in the last like week of class, right? And you can't get to email to send me an email and I have to post grades. I'll just put an incomplete on there until I hear from you, um, one way or another, um, so that we can figure something else out. Um, these grayed out instructions more or less describe that. Uh, it's just what it'll look like when we go back to class. It's, it's describing that right now. Um, office hours, I'm still working with Breeze to figure out what hers are going to look like. Um, mine at the moment are those lab hours, so 11 to 1. Um, it'll be a Zoom meeting for now. Uh, it'll probably continue to be Zoom even if we go back to in-person, and I'll just be physically in the room with Zoom up on my laptop, so you can show up there if you want. Uh, or if you want to physically show up to the room, you can also do that. Um, but those are essentially my office hours right now, um, is that two hour block on, on Thursdays. The grades in the class, um, I think you can read through on here. The only thing that I'll note um, is that our late uh, submission, uh, what would you call it, policy uh, in this class is maybe a little bit different from other classes. I don't necessarily accept 
late homework unless it falls into one of these categories. So all of you have one of these bronze, silver, and gold tokens right now. You can check your grades um, to see that you have one of those. Uh, and those get sort of automatically redeemed for late homework submissions, and you get one of each. So you can be an hour late on one of them, or 12 hours late, or 24 hours late. If you don't use them, then those tokens go to your um, final grade at the end of class. So if you can avoid using them, then you get a, a bonus at the end of, of class. Um, I do that in lieu of like rounding or trying to handle late submissions um, one at a time. Um, academic integrity, uh, the easiest way that I can summarize it is that your work should be a product of your own effort. Um, so I'll let you read through here. There is a brief academic integrity review quiz on Canvas that you'll have to complete um, before you gain access to like the homeworks and the drop boxes and stuff like that. Um, you can take it as many times as you want, uh, and you just have to keep taking it until you get a perfect score on it. Um, and that's to try to get us on the same page with what I'm expecting um, in class. Um, and then as far as course content goes, you can get an idea of uh, what direction we're headed by checking here. The way that I'm structuring the class is uh, closer to the way that I think most of you probably learn when you have to learn something new on your own. Um, usually it, it, it's kind of like learning a language, right? If you have to learn a new language, most people don't recommend that you sit down in front of a dictionary and just start memorizing words, right? That, that's, it's not really going to help you. It'll build up your vocabulary a lot, but it, it won't really help you. Um, more often, that sort of immersive learning is more the way that most people are recommended to learn a new language. I'm slowly trying to learn Spanish and, and doing it in that way um, through immersive learning. And that's kind of what we've got here. So rather than start with MATLAB at the, on the very first day and just start saying like, this is how you make variables and this is how you create a matrix and index into a matrix. Um, we're going to have projects, or in this case, simulations, um, that build up in complexity over the process of the course or progress of the course um, that give us something that we can kind of sink our hands into, right? And say, I know what I'm trying to achieve here or, or generally what I'm trying to achieve. Um, and we're going to treat that as sort of the, the classroom, the sandbox, uh, where we learn how to do that kind of stuff in MATLAB. So we've, we've got an end point in mind, right? We're not just sort of putting out feelers and figuring out what MATLAB can do. Um, we're, we're trying to set a particular goal for ourselves um, and achieve that in either MATLAB or Excel. We'll start off with some of the simpler ones in Excel um, and then sort of focus on, on MATLAB um, as we go. Um, I did mention the grades. Um, if you click over on your grade, so this is being listed as um, test student right now, I've disabled the calculation of totals in Canvas because they, they're calculations and they're all wacky. Um, I, I have no idea. I, do, I could figure out how they're calculating that stuff, but it doesn't have anything to do with the class. Uh, the only thing that you need to pay attention to are the grades on the individual assignments. Um, if I were to enable the grade total thing, it would just sort of average everything as though it was equally weighted, um, and that's not what it says in the syllabus. Those tokens that I had mentioned before, you should have a bronze, a gold, and a silver, or in some order like that. Um, and you should have, um, yours will probably say one out of one right here, and that's how many tokens you have left. Um, remember, it's automatic, so as you submit assignments, we'll just check the times when you submit them. And if any of them are late, we'll pick whatever is the smallest token um, that'll let you submit that assignment on time. If you run out of tokens and then you keep submitting things that are late, those don't get graded. Those get zeros. Um, so you've only got those those three tokens. But there's only going to be, I think, like six or seven homework assignments. So it, it's not like you're going to have 40 assignments and you've only got three chances to miss the deadline by a little bit. I think there's only going to be six or seven assignments. So um, you should be in, I think, pretty good shape with this. Um, when you go over to the modules page on Canvas, uh, and this is the last thing that I want to show you on Canvas, um, you should have the class resources up here at the top, how to watch what you're watching right now, um, as well as how to get Excel and MATLAB. Um, if you don't have Excel and MATLAB today, it's not the end of the world. You can still watch along. Um, I know there's things like Google Sheets and LibreCalc out there that are really similar to Excel. I would suggest that you don't uh, use those for this class, partly because if there's just a small change in the interface, it can be really 
annoyingly difficult to figure out what was that change and what does it look like over here versus over here. Um, and some of the stuff they may not have. Um, so I would just suggest that you use um, Excel. It's also free. It's not going to cost you anything. And it's highly likely that after you graduate, whatever company you work for um, is going to end up having access to Excel. So it'll be a good one. Um, for MATLAB, you've got two options. You can either install it uh, directly on your machine and that's the way that I usually like to run it because it's a little bit faster if you do that although in most cases it's not noticeably faster um, there are tons of I think there's like 30 toolboxes or 20 toolboxes these are usually the ones that I install on my machine um, but if you don't want to install those or you miss one or you later you come around and want another one you can add them as you go um, you don't have to install them all right now you can add them to your installation if you don't want to install anything on your computer, um, you can also access a web-based version of MATLAB, which has all of the toolboxes already available um, and doesn't require any installation. So you can create all your files on there. Um, it's a little annoying if I ever give you a data file. You have to do sort of one extra step of uploading it. Um, and then when you want to submit your assignments, you're going to have to download your assignments. But it, it's a pretty minimal barrier, right? It, it doesn't take very much effort to do either one of those. Um, so you can most likely complete the entire class um, using the online version. There will come a time at the end of class when our simulations get a little bit bigger uh, that it may be annoying to use the online version, um, but it should still be possible. Um, and then last but not least, there is uh, MATLAB Academy, um, which I'll make reference to occasionally throughout the course when we introduce new topics. Um, Academy is another way to learn MATLAB. Um, and they take a similar approach, not quite as project-based as us, but they sort of pick a topic and then explore it. Um, and so I will point to various sections of the Academy um, for you to go to to learn more about a particular element that we're trying to do. You know, maybe it's indexing or you know, maybe it's matrices or root finding or something like that. Um, I authored a few of those sections on Academy um, for the math and optimization stuff. Um, and those are based on lectures from Sense15. Um, so they are, of course, rather useful um, for Sense15. Academy is entirely optional, too. Um, it, it's not like you... It, it sort of serves the role as our textbook. Um, there, there's no required textbook for this class. Um, everything that we would need is, is sitting inside of Academy. Um, or I'm going to present it as part of Excel, right? One of, one of those two, one or the other. So I'm just going to pause here for a minute um, in case you have any questions. I'm going to move over to Excel next. Um, so if you need to fire up Excel and get your um, display working correctly, um, take a couple of minutes to do that. Um, remember, I am also watching chat. So this is our course chat over here. I've just got it over next to the side. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please feel free to throw them in the chat. But I'm just going to wait maybe two or three minutes here um, if you have any questions. Uh, otherwise, we'll move over to um, Excel for our next portion of the class. Okay, let's go ahead and switch over. It's been about two minutes now. So this is um, what you will normally see in Excel. Of course, you probably won't have any previous files um, that are sitting down here. Um, I don't think I've ever used any of the tutorials or anything on here, so usually I just go to a blank workbook. Um, Excel's documents are organized as workbooks. 
And then within each workbook are worksheets, um, and those sort of represent single pages um, within a workbook. Although if you ever try to print them out, they are quite a bit bigger than a, a single page. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start a blank workbook. Most of the time we will start with a, a blank workbook um, in class. I'm also going to make my workbook a little bit bigger, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit to about 130%. Um, that's just so that you can see the text. Right, so that's roughly how big the text will show up um, when I'm typing. Uh, I don't often operate at 130% zoom when I'm usually using uh, Excel, but it's just there so you, that you can um, see it. A couple of things that are on here um, that are worth pointing out. Um, the first one is this bar up here at the top. Uh, yours might look different from something like that. That's the quick access toolbar. Um, and that's where you can go to put various buttons and functions that don't show up right here on the home ribbon um, that you use often. So for example, I've got a sort feature that I like to use a lot. There's a goal seek feature and often I like to hide the grid lines. Um, yours probably don't have that and I'm not going to make a lot of use of them during class. So it's okay if yours doesn't look the same as that. I don't know what you would have up there. It's probably something else. Um, as far as the tabs that we have, you should have the home tab right now open. That's usually the one that opens. You will probably not have the draw tab um, unless you have a tablet connected to your laptop or if you're on, I don't know, maybe you're on a tablet type uh, laptop or you're on you know, an iPad or something like that. That's just for tablets. Um, so if I have to write anything by hand, um, I usually use the draw tab. You probably won't have that and you don't need it. The one that you do need that you may not have um, is the developer tab. Um, that one is going to have some things on it that we need to use uh, to add some functionality to our um, spreadsheets as we go about uh, making the spreadsheets. So if you don't have the developer tab, um, all I suggest is you just Google it. Um, so something like uh, Excel add developer tab should get you what you need. Uh, whenever you try to Google something about how to do something in um, Excel, try to find the ones that are actually from uh, Microsoft's website. So if the answers are from Microsoft.com, they're probably going to be what you want and they'll be up to date. Uh, Excel has been around a long time and so you can find out of date information. Um, but if you need something like how to show the developer tab in um, Excel, you should be able to find it pretty quickly with a Google search and then finding whatever their website happens to be. Um, and so I'm not going to go over this right now. I'll allow you to do that on your own time. We don't need the developer tab right now, but sooner or later you will need the, the developer tab. Um, and there may be one or two other things that we uh, need along the way. We'll, we'll tackle them whenever we get to them. Um, that big part up at the top, just in case you're unfamiliar with uh, what these things are called, this is called the ribbon um, up at the top. Most programs have a ribbon at this point. Um, some do and some do not, but that's what we're looking at up here uh, at the top is our, our ribbon. Sometimes I like to minimize the ribbon when I'm working with you um, because I need more space on here. Uh, so if you don't see the ribbon up at the top, it might just be because I've, I've minimized it. Um, if you want to modify any of the appearances, all of that kind of looks the same as most uh, word processors do, so I, I'm not going to cover the majority of that. And then we'll pick up a handful of things uh, that are also on the ribbon um, as we go, as we need more and more things. The first thing that I'm going to show you how to do uh, is freeze panes. So I'm going to divide my um, Excel uh, window here into sort of two panes. There'll be a narrow pane on the left uh, and a wider pane on the right. The wider pane on the right is where we'll do our work. Um, the narrow pane on the left um, is where I will sort of summarize a few notes. So I'll put the notes over here uh, and I'll put work over here. And what I would like is for the work to, or the, the notes to show up all the time. So to get uh, notes to stay visible, use freeze panes. All right, so what I want is as I scroll to the, the right, I want that information to stay there the whole time. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is click on the word work uh, and then up in view, 
there's an option over here called freeze panes. Um, and what that it does exactly what it sounds like it does. It takes certain elements of the uh, screen and freezes them in place so they don't move. Um, it depends on where you've clicked, so you can play around with clicking in different places. But all I want right now is for those left maybe five rows or five columns or something like that to stay in place. So I'm going to say freeze panes um, and I'm going to click the top one. There are two autos here. You can either freeze the top row or freeze the first column. Freeze panes is more flexible. It will freeze things based on the current selection. So I'm going to click that. You'll notice this line um, showed up on here and now if I try to scroll to the right um, the notes stay on there um, which is kind of nice particularly for lectures so that I can make little notes over there that stay present um, as we're going through uh, each one of these. The sort of miniature project that we're going to work on today, we've got about 25 minutes left, um, is an introduction to plotting things in Excel. Less so about plotting. You, you can probably hack your way through and plot something pretty quickly uh, if you haven't done it already in a, a spreadsheet program like Excel somewhere else. Um, it's, it's more about a, learning a couple of the shortcuts that are going to come up a lot, um, and B, learning some of the data structures um, that we need. Because, like I said earlier when we were talking about, you know, the name of the course being Engineering Computation Using MATLAB, the disadvantage of MATLAB is that it's not always easy to see what your data structures look like. Um, they're there, and, and we'll spend time figuring out what things look like. Um, but in Excel, you can see all of those structures, so it's nice to have them sort of labeled um, so that you get an idea of, of what you want. So um, to make a plot, and I'm going to sort of walk through these steps in a way that is transferable, right? We can describe it this way in Excel, and we do the same thing over in MATLAB, right? The, the steps are the same, they just look a little bit different. So to make a plot, uh, we do a few things. The, the first thing we do is uh, make a vector of x values, um, and then we make a vector of y values. Right? That is the same in Excel um, as it is in MATLAB. So it's nice in, Mat in Excel that we can see that. The function that we're going to um, plot uh, is the normal function. So as our example, um, we're going to plot the normal function. Um, and just so that we can get a picture of this, normal function, we'll just grab the function from Wikipedia so that we've got a little picture of it here. Uh, and then we will take that and put it in Excel. So here's our normal function. There's no way for Excel, as far as I'm aware of, um, to take what looks like handwritten code um, and turn it into actual code inside of Excel. So we're just putting that here as our sort of reference, right, so that we know um, what the normal function looks like. Uh, and so we're going to plot f of x as a function of x, um, and we're going to do it for particular values of the parameters that are in here. So a couple of the parameters that are here that we're going to have to pick. Um, there's sigma, which is a standard deviation. So this is standard deviation, which you will learn much more about in um, our statistics class in 114. Uh, and then the other parameter that's up here is mu. Um, this is your mean. Um, and we're just going to pick values for that. We're, we're just going to set the mean um, is equal to 0, and we're going to set the standard deviation equal to 1. So the actual function that we're going to be writing is a little bit easier um, than what you see here, because a lot of that is either 1 or 0, which is nice. Um, it means we don't have to work quite as hard. Um, although we will sort of enhance our uh, plotting capabilities um, pretty soon. So the first thing that I'm going to do is create, like in step one, step one here, a vector of x values. So that'll be x, and then next to it I'll make f of x. For reasons that are going to become important later, we're going to add a third column. But at the moment we don't need it, but we will. More so even in Excel, um, but especially in MATLAB, we'll need a, a third column on there that's sort of invisible, it's along for the ride all the time, uh, but we don't always see it, uh, but we have to make use of it fairly often. 
in Excel, there's a couple of different ways that you can make vectors. Um, the two most common ways to make vectors are, let's say we wanted to plot this from minus 3 to 3. So we would start off with minus 3, and then we write the next value that we want in the plot um, by whatever difference we want. So maybe instead of minus 3, we want it to go to minus 2.5, right, and sort of continue that pattern. Um, you can type that in by hand. Uh, if it's a short pattern, it may be fast enough for you to just keep typing that from minus 3 to plus 3. Uh, but Excel has a couple of different ways that it can autofill things for you. The most common of which is to highlight the first two elements that you have on here. And if you let your cursor hover on the very bottom right, you'll see that it changes, right? Over here, it's sort of this big plus sign. Um, if you can look at the very bottom right of that cell, it turns into a much smaller plus sign, kind of like a crosshair. Um, and as long as you've got those two cells highlighted, you can click and drag, and there will be a little pop-up that shows you what it thinks is the next element in that pattern. Um, and this is the most common way, I would say one of the two most common ways that we would generate um, a series of data. Um, so for example, this one I just dragged until it got to three. I don't really know how many elements are in there, and I don't really care. Um, I just wanted it to go from minus 3 up to 3 in increments of about 0 0.5. The other way to do that is through a, a different kind of autofill that requires that other imaginary, well, invisible um, column that we don't have visible on here that we're now going to make visible. And this other one, this invisible one, that's the one that's used in MATLAB far more often. It, it, there's no equivalent of autofill like as a drag feature like we just did on here. So let's say we remove um, all of these uh, and instead of x I can have another column here called idx which I'm going to call index. That's what idx stands for. Um, and maybe I know ahead of time that I need 10 values. Right? I need to plot 10 values. Um, and so I can start this one building up as like 1, 2, 3 um, and then drag that down to 10. So there's my 10 values, right? It, it's only the indices, though, right? It's, it's the first element, the second element, the third element, etc. The actual values need to count from minus 3 by minus 0 0.5, or, or plus 0 0.5, up until we have 10 values. Um, that's much more common in MATLAB. If you want to do it in Excel, uh, you would highlight these two, and instead of clicking and dragging, which you can still do, um, if you double click on the bottom right, it'll auto populate down to wherever the end of the left column is. So it automatically gives us 10 values. That's not quite what we wanted, right? We wanted to go all the way up to three, um, so I would add a couple of uh, elements here and double click again until it gets down to where we want. Um, this is a method that's explicit in MATLAB, even though you can't see what it's actually doing. It'll just automatically generate. If you tell it, I want 13 values between minus 3 and plus 3, it'll just give you those 13 values. Um, and so that's why I bring it up here. Although in Excel, it's not common that we actually need to show this index column, so I'm going to turn it to kind of a lighter gray. Um, it's there, but we don't always need it um, per se. And then we need to write our um, function. So we need to do a, a math calculation here. Um, so uh, to perform math, start with an equal sign. Right? Anytime you want a cell to have math in it, start it with an equal sign. Um, and now it's doing math. Right? It'll, it'll calculate whatever we want. So the first part of the function that we have down there is 1 over the square root of 2 times pi. So I'll write 1 over the square root of 2 times pi. Notice what I put after pi. I put two parentheses after pi. Um, if you just leave plain old pi, um, it won't know what to do with that. But if you put pi parentheses, now it knows give me the function pi, which returns 3.14159, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I put two times pi and then open close um, parentheses. I bring that up because we need pi a lot. We use pi for a lot of different um, calculations. And then I'll close my square root. Uh, and then multiply that by the exponential. So the, if you ever see the letter E, um, in nearly all coding languages, that is uh, coded as EXP. Um, and then open parentheses, so we're going to calculate the exponential of a number. Uh, and in this case, if we look at the function that I've got there, it'll be minus 0 0.5 times x squared. What I would like to be able to do is type x and sort of square it, right? I would like to be able to count 
or write something like x squared like this. Um, if you try that, Excel won't know what you're talking about. So if I close that parenthesis, I've completed the function, um, but when I go to hit enter, it's going to give me an error. Right? It's going to say name. That's its way of saying, I have no idea what you're talking about when you say x. Um, so if you look inside of this function again, which by the way, to, when you have a cell like that and you want to see what's inside of it, um, there's two ways to see what's inside of it. When you hover on a cell like that, the contents of the cell show up up here. So you can see the formula um, that's sitting inside of there. But the other way to do it, if you want to see this um, actually in the cell, so if you want it to show up down here with like syntax highlighting and stuff like that, when you're on the cell, hit F2 on your keyboard um, and it will show up on there. If you're on a Mac, you might have to hit something like Command F2. Um, I'm not sure what the variation is that you would need on a Mac. But for example, right here in um, Windows, I'm sitting on that cell, so I hit F2 uh, and it pulls up that formula. This is usually the way that I will look at functions um, because this shows you syntax highlighting. It, it'll show you which cells are actually being used um, in your function. So instead of X here, I'm going to um, backspace to delete the X. And instead of just using X, I'm going to click on the cell that I want to be X. So in this case, it's going to be G4. Um, and you'll notice G4 shows up in there. Uh, and now if I hit Enter, OK, well, now it happens to be calculating as though it's a date. Um, if you happen to get something as a, a date, um, there are ways to change the display of your numbers, um, which is up here. So if you're getting it as like a date or something like that, um, just change it from custom uh, back to general. Um, and general should display it as an actual number. So I'm going to click on general here, and now it just looks like a number. Excel is kind of annoying with dates. They show up when they shouldn't. Uh, but at any rate, now I am calculating the correct value. Uh, the nice thing about autofill in Excel is the same way that it can pick up patterns just based on the numbers you have, right? It knew minus 3 and then minus 2.5, that the next element in that pattern is probably minus 2. Um, it can auto-update your function um, using that autofill feature. So I'm going to go to the bottom right of this uh, cell and double-click, and it will take that um, formula and in, in sort of the parlance it will drag that formula down uh, and auto update it as we go so if I look at this middle one and hit F2 I see that it's now calculating that function for zero right whatever the value is that's that's next to it if desired if there's a problem here you can always grab that cell if you grab the border of the cell you can move it around right if I didn't if, if there was a problem here and I needed it to actually be two you can drag it up to that particular cell. I, I don't want it to be. It's correct, but you can um, if you need to. That one's unchanged, though, so I'm going to leave it um, the way that it is. The other thing that you can do, so that was a double-click fill, uh, you can also do the drag fill. Right? That will accomplish exactly the same thing. Um, and now we have our two vectors. Um, we have a vector for x, and we have a vector for um, f of x. A little bit of nomenclature here, um, which this is one of the reasons why we're spending time plotting, um, is important because it's going to show up again in uh, MATLAB. This label up here where we have um, X, notice that it's not really used in the computation, right? If you were to look in any of the functions that we have over here, if you look at that code, it's not actually using x itself, right? x is there for us. It's to remind us that this column means x. Uh, and so this is closer to something that we would call a label, right? It, it doesn't actually participate in the calculation itself. Um, it's only there for our own benefit, right? So that we can see uh, what's being calculated. The same thing goes with f of x, right? Even though we wrote that as f and then opened a parenthesis, put x in it, and closed it, it didn't calculate anything. It just saw it as a label. Um, another word for uh, label, um, which we will see later, uh, is a comment. Those, it, it sort of depends on what you're trying to accomplish, whether or not you need a comment or a label. Um, and then a third one that we will use that's sort of related um, is a variable. None of which represent the actual number that we're interested in, right? It, it, they're just there to remind us of what this thing is. 
Um, they're, they're not the actual thing we're operating on, uh, and so it's important to keep those distinctions in mind. Variables and comments and labels are quite different, um, but they are all similar in the sense that those are not the actual numbers that we're calculating. They are some kind of a container that either holds them or represents them or gives us some information about them. The data structures that we have um, on the screen right now uh, are vectors, right? Remember over here we had said uh, make a vector of x values and make a vector of y values. Uh, those are present on the screen. So this value, which it's really hard for me to draw a straight line down here. Let's just assume that that is something resembling a straight line. Oh, I've got my screen tilted a little bit. Maybe that's why. Now can I draw a straight line? Nope. Last time, and then we're just going to go with whatever we get on this one. That's not bad. So this um, column of data points on here, um, this is something that we would call a column vector. It's called a column vector, obviously because it is a column, um, and it's called a vector because it's got more than one data element in it. Um, there's three column vectors here, right? There's the x column vector, the f of x column vector, so there's um, an x one here, there's f of x, there's also idx, which is what we call an index, um, index here, which is grayed out because it's usually not present uh, visually, right? It, it's part of the data in a way that we will see later, um, but it, it's usually not an actual vector that we have to create. Uh, we just sort of use it in our minds to remind us uh, that there is such a thing as an index. Um, so for example, the fourth element of x uh, is 1.5, right? And the seventh element of f of x is 0.39894. Um, it's just a, a way for us to assign a location inside of those data structures um, that will become quite useful um, later on. There's a third uh, data structure here, which is if all of these data points are, or all of these uh, numerical values are right next to each other, right? It's a column vector, a column vector, and a column vector. Um, and so if you imagine um, all three of these as being a single um, data structure, right? So I'm going to imagine that all three of those are sort of contained in something. Um, this is called a matrix. Column vectors and matrices, or I, I should say matrices more particularly, are how MATLAB works. Um, a more general word for a matrix is what's called an array. Um, Everything inside of MATLAB, its core structure is an array um, that can be, for example, something like a matrix or, or a vector. Um, so it's important, even though we don't need those particular terms right now in Excel, like you didn't need to know that that was called a column vector in order to make one, it's going to be more important in MATLAB because it will help you visualize what the data look like. Uh, there will be ways for us to see them in MATLAB, uh, but vectors and matrices come up an awful lot inside of MATLAB. Um, so whenever I have a chance on here, and at any time that I remember it, um, I will uh, point out where we have um, column vectors and matrices. But for plotting purposes, we need, actually, I'm going to turn my mic down a little bit. It looks like a couple of those have gone red, so I'm just going to turn it down a couple of decibels there. Um, for plotting purposes, we always need a vector of x values and an, a vector of y values. There are some edge cases where we don't necessarily need vectors of both of them. Um, we can also use matrices for some of them, but they get kind of confusing, so we just need vectors of both of them. To plot something inside of um, Excel, the easiest way is if you do have a vector next to a vector, is to highlight both of those uh, vectors. So here I just clicked and dragged over all of them. Um, that box that's being uh, closed and closed there is a matrix. Um, it's what we would call, uh, in this case, a 13 row and two column matrix, or what we would call a 13 by two um, matrix. If you include the index column, then it becomes a 13 by 3 matrix, because there's three columns to it. Uh, again, that terminology will be important later um, when we get to MATLAB, so I'm trying to reinforce it here as we go. To actually do the plot's not that hard, right? Like I said earlier, if you've plotted in any kind of spreadsheet stuff, you probably already have your plot up. Um, but I would request that you follow a particular 
uh, what would we call it, convention for your plot. Um, anytime that you have um, plots, there's, there's two conventions that we use. The first convention um, is that data points are points. They're exactly that, right? They're, they're not lines, they're points. Um, on the other hand, functions and curves, or things like that, are lines. That's a convention uh, not for um, Senj15, but more like all of STEM um, uses that kind of a convention. So if there's not a function that is supposed to connect two points, those points probably shouldn't be connected. Uh, they should just be sitting there as individual data points. And if you are plotting a function, then we don't usually think of a function as consisting of individual data points, even though the plot does, uh, but rather we think of it as a smooth function between two points, or, or two over a particular range, something like that. So I would ask um, that you follow this convention in this class, um, which means the majority of the stuff that we're going to be plotting are lines, because we're going to focus a lot on functions. Um, but there may be a few data points in there. The other point that I'll put on here as a convention um, is that these are straight lines, not uh, any kind of a smooth line. And that's one that might be a little bit new. Um, I know some people like to smooth their lines um, because they think they look a little bit better. Um, that may be the case, but it's not a convention that we follow in STEM because it introduces behavior that's not actually present in that function. Um, it introduces like a rounding or an interpolation or something like that that's not present in the actual function. So when I want to plot this normal function, I'm going to highlight these and over on the insert uh, ribbon, I'll come over to charts um, and underneath charts is insert scatter. My apologies, you might be able to hear mirror in the background. Um, I have two dogs. I, undoubtedly, they will join us on camera sooner or later, but right now Mir is barking in the background. I'm going to insert a scatter chart, um, and there's a lot of different options here. Almost always the one that you want for something like this is on the bottom right. Uh, it's scatter with straight lines. Or if you happen to be plotting data, which is a little bit less common, then you want the one on the top left, which is just a plain old scatter, right? It just shows dots um, going through there. What we're plotting is a function, um, so we will use um, a scatter with straight lines. The one not to use is this one in the top right that's a scatter with smooth lines. Don't use that um, because it's artificially introducing some kind of a smoothing function to your plot uh, that's not actually present. If you need the plot to look smoother, add more data points um, and it will look smoother. So I'll click that and now we've got our um, chart on here. I am of the habit of moving it um, because it's usually placed like right on top of our data. So I'm going to move it over to the right here um, and scroll over to the right. When you've got your um, chart, the very first thing that I do is add um, some chart elements to it. So let me see if I can get these to uh, show up. If you click on your chart, then on the top right should be a little plus sign um, and you want to go to axes titled. Um, so always label your axes. That's what that's doing, is labeling your axes. Uh, and then you can double click on these uh, and just rename them to something like f and uh, f of x. You should never have a chart that doesn't have labeled axes. Um, a little bit less common actually is a chart title, uh, this one. We're going to leave it on there for now, um, but generally speaking we don't title things, we're going to use them as sort of a, a toy feature for a little bit um, of our Excel stuff that we have on there, kind of a way to give us information. But most of the time when you're, for example, creating a, a plot that's going to go into a report that you're writing, it's kind of rare that they actually have chart titles. Um, so for at least right now, I'm going to delete that chart title so that we don't have to look at it. So that's the basics of getting um, a chart shown on here. You need a uh, vector of x values, a vector of y values, and then you connect them with straight lines if they're a function, and you connect them with points if they're not. We're going to come back to this on Wednesday um, and learn how we can utilize some more tools in Excel that add some functionality to these plots, um, and also introduce some more uh, data structures that show up in both uh, Excel and in, in MATLAB. Um, if you want a little bit of uh, 
uh, challenge to work on here now that we're done with class. See if you can up the number of points here um, to 100 because when we come back to it on Wednesday, we're going to start with this plot with 100 points on it. Um, so it, it can be a, a useful exercise to try to get 100 points on there, still between minus 3 um, and plus 3. But for now, that's where I want to finish up with today. I'm going to try to um, keep my time as close to 12.50 as I can, so we just rolled over 12.50 here, because um, I know some of you will have other classes to get to. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, I will stick around over in Canvas chat uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask me. Um, but as far as Twitch goes, uh, I'm going to wrap that one up, um, and I will see you back here on Wednesday. Um, stay safe out there, stay healthy, um, and have a good one. We'll see you on Wednesday.